Hello my loyal Vagabond viewers, I'm here at Clint Crags today, about two miles south of Isaacburn in Weirdale, on this cloudy but mildly clement day. I was curious about the origin of the Crags name and was directed to meet a contact by a friend of ours called Gordon Lightfoot. Uh, and the contact I met is apparently uh, the patron of the Vagabond Order House at Stanham where I met a vagabond cleric called Brother Martin who told, who directed me, who directed me to the conversation book uh, that, that in the vagabond house um, where I discovered the tangled tale of uh, Clint Craggs itself. Now the tale begins with uh, someone called Clint, the apprentice of a wizard stain of Stanhop and Eastgate in the year 1595. Uh, apparently, Clint was instructed by the Wizard Stain to seek and find the fabled Rainbow Phoenix Egg, which hatches on Midsummer Day every 94 years. The Wizard needed the, the yolk of this particular Phoenix Egg as the key magical ingredient for the alchemical secret of eternal life which the wizard had been instructed to discover by his royal patron, court magician to Elizabeth I, John Dee. Now, Clint departed on his quest to find the fabled Phoenix Egg in mid-June. He was expected to return in about a week and a half, ten days roughly. Uh, after a month had gone by, with him still missing, a search party was duly dispatched by Wizard Stain from Stanhop, who, who eventually found his mutilated remains at the bottom of the crags themselves, which speculate it was somewhere over there, according to historical research, um, sometime in mid-July. To this day, nobody knows exactly how he met his gruesome fate, but the strange gouges upon his face and body suggest the Rainbow Phoenix killed him. Uh, instinctively defending its nest. So that's how Clint Craggs got its ominous name. But did his soul find peace in the dreamlands, or the shadowlands as it's called, or was it fated to wander the crags eternally uh, as, as, the, as, as a restless ghost? We'll never really know for sure. Well, this is all very fine. But there is another layer to this story. Because indeed, Clint fell from the cracks. And his mangled body was indeed found at the base. And in mid July, as Dr. Beedale has said, the body was found and was taken back to Stanhope for preparation for wake and for burial. But it is known to those who know that as Clint fell from the cracks, he let out a despairing cry from the very depth of the soul and the piper who has had business in the dreamlands near about heard his final soul cry and he came to the crags and he found the body of Clint lying upon the banks and he took up the body and laid it beside him and sat he upon the crag itself with his harp upon his lap and his pipes to one side. And he wept, for he knew that Clint was a young man of great talent and promise. He knew also that Stain the wizard was childless. And he knew also that the line of the wizards of Stanhope would be no more. And so he cut the strings of his harp with a scissor that he would play never. And he took up his pipes and he winded them. And he played upon them a dirge and lament and frenzy that would carry the young wizard's soul into the Shadowlands, into the land of death. And the echo of that lament ran up and down the valley such that the good villagers of Isaac and Chapel wondered what had befallen. So we can say with some certainty that his soul now resides in the Shadowlands, 
and no longer haunts these tracks. Is at peace. And is at peace. Yes, thank you. And that is the legend of Clint Craggs, which is which is reco officially recorded in the Vagabond Conversation book in Stammer. It is indeed. And other sources, I do believe. Well, that the tale of the Piper is certainly known to the Keeper of Antiquities at Keatley. And of and other institutions as well. Indeed, that's correct. This is for connecting from Gordon. He's, he's informed us about all this. Well, I think he's very knowledgeable. Well, I knew of the tale from my contact at Keatley anyway. But yes, Gordon is also aware of this particular... Is it one of the addendum. professors at Keatley you told you about this yeah, connection with the paper? Might actually be Big Tyler herself, in fact. Um, and for those who were curious, the Piper is also, I do believe, connected to the Library Guardian of Bishop Parker and the other places. The Piper and library, the Library Garden, Guardian are kin, yes. They are, what's the word? Uh, spiritual cousins. Spiritual cousins, yes, that's correct. They're both elemental spirits, essentially. Elemental archetypes. Spirit, yeah. Arch elemental archetypes, that's right. And they both have many badges upon themselves. Oh. I would like you to mention that. I have not described the pipe yet. Ah, he's coming to that, uh, viewers. <laughs> <laughs> the description of the piper, very specific. He sits upon the crag with his feet upon the banks of the burn. He's a giant, by the way. His boots of leather, with, la with 94 laces of... 94... <laughs> <laughs> Take two! <laughs> oh, oh, you've got <laughs> this! <laughs> Here we go, yes. You've got this. With, with boots of leather, laces of cowhide, cowhide, sir, cowhide, laces of cowhide and 94, 90, 94 lace holes. <laughs> His kilt of, of green and purple in bewildering, ever-changing yes. colour. It does shift colour. Reaching oh, to yeah. his knees. And his badge is also His, his, his woollen wool shirt in dense checker work of red and white and, and black. He's got some very magic, there's a magical element to his badge. His, 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 his black waistcoat strung about with uncountable thousands of, of badges of great pipers throughout the ages. There's a couple of dozen at the Cape 50, you know? We only ever see a handful, but yeah. they're ever changing, these changing. medallions. Patterns great, great names such as Guillaume de Machaut, Guillaume de Fay. John Dunstable, Thomas Tallis, the Piper at the Gates of Dawn, Quite an esteemed pipe in the George Clinton, Mark E. Smith, Miles Davis, greatest of us all. That's clear. <laughs> Chris Potter. I don't know him, you want to tell of you there, you. Mike Patton, didn't I mention Mike Patton before? I don't think so. Ludwig van Beethoven. I'm sure they know who he is. Luigi Nono. Luciano Berdio, Steve Reich. The list goes on, as many as you like. On. <laughs> a strange and imposing figure when encountered. Whose feet apparently reached from, when, when he sits upon the top, his feet reach to, like, almost to the bottom, so that gives you kind of an indication of how tall he is. I'm just going to get a feet. Well, the, the, the drone on his, on his bagpipes oh, are, are longer than a man is tall. We're pretty tall. We're the bag tall. of his bagpipes has a capacity of 107 litres of pure mountain air. Not 94, is it? 107. <laughs> the seven chanters made of black ebony from the forest of Anuvin. Oh. Within 94 finger holes. That's impressive. Notice, notice viewers, there's this sort of connection of 94 recurring periodically. It keeps coming up for some reason. It's one of those synchronicities we do believe. We believe it is a magic number. Exactly. It is, it is, it is the, num the fundamental number of the universe. It's a number of imaginary things. It's an elemental number of great significance in every universe. And I think on that inspiring note, we shall, we shall end the video there. So, <laughs> Thank you for viewers who continued watching up to this point. We're very grateful and we look forward to your potential comments. And if you like it enough, please do subscribe to our channel. And thank you for Professor Beedale for enlightening us. Thank you very much viewers. Take care.